Welcome to Ask GC Anything. Me on my Todd this week, but please don't let that put you off watching the rest of it. Uh, I'll be answering a number of your cycling related questions, including how do you prevent cramp? How much time should you spend in the big ring? And can you get sunburns through your cycling jersey? Plus, because there's been so much racing on over the last couple of weeks, we've got a special quick fire round dedicated to all things pro cycling. Now, if you've not watched and asked you anything before, uh, just to let you know, we answer as many cycling related questions as we can. If you'd like to get involved with a question of your own, leave them in the comments section below this video or over on social media using the hashtag talkback and the exact spelling of that should be on the screen right now. The first question today is in fact pro cycling related and it comes in from Sam Pultney. Uh, he asks, when, what happens to two leaders jerseys are collected, which one takes priority? For example, a younger rider or climber's jersey? Which is an interesting question that I didn't know the answer to. So I had to ask Tom Southern, who is a sports director at EF Education First Draft Pack presented or powered by Cannondale. Uh, he's been in the office a little bit recently because he's been our expert for some Giro d'Italia highlights that we've been doing for Euro sport and he said that this exact question was a part of his sports director's course at the UCI as he was getting his qualification and his answer is that this is the order of priority for leaders jerseys at Grand Tours. Uh, first up the overall leader of the race, next up sprints, then the KOM jersey and then the young riders jersey after that. And that has actually been happening at the Giro d'Italia this year because Simon Yates, who's been leading the race for a lot of it so far, has also been leading the King of the Mountains jersey. So that blue jersey at the Giro has been worn on his behalf by a couple of other riders, including his teammate Esteban Chavez. It's quite a complicated subject, uh, as is a lot of pro cycling in general. If you'd like to know how those leaders jerseys are earned and how you win the race, such as the Giro d'Italia, I explain a lot of that in this next video. The Maglia Azzurra, or blue jersey, is the climbers competition. Each climb along the route is given a difficulty rating by the organisers, from category 1 to category 4, with the harder the climb being deemed, the more points being on offer. So, for example, if you are the first over the top of a category 1 climb, you will receive 35 points. If you are first over the top of a category 4 climb, you will receive just 3 points. Our next question came in under an Ask GC Anything for a couple of weeks ago from Minjin025. If pro teams frequently purchase their own bike parts, and there's no performance difference between Ultegra and Dura Ace other than weight, and most racers need to add weight to their bikes, why would teams choose to pay so much more for parts that have no performance benefit, especially when they are going to negate the only real world benefit of Dura Ace by adding weight to the bike? This is a really good question. I can only speculate, I'm afraid. I think it might come down to psychology of pro riders. You'll find that pro riders always want to be using the best equipment, and if they think they're using subpar equipment, they might well perform uh, slightly lower than they probably should do. Uh, for example, I heard that earlier on this year, Team Trek-Segafredo were supplied by Shimano with their new clutch rear mech for the cobbled classics in order to give them a bit more stability and less chance of the chain jump. When John Dagenkolb came down and found an Ultegra clutch rear mech on his bike, his first question was, why do I have an Ultegra rear mech on my bike? And I don't think he was very happy about it. They're quite a delicate bunch when it comes to their psychology as pro cyclists, so the teams want to pander to them to make sure they perform as well as possible. I can also tell you that there are a number of teams out there, which as you mentioned are not sponsored by Shimano, who do provide their riders with training bikes that have a full Ultegra group set just to save some money. Uh, I think this question probably did originate though from a, a video that I did very recently comparing Ultegra versus Dura Ace, where we did kind of conclude that the only difference between the two group sets is weight, which was a really interesting thing to find out. Uh, it came from, from Shimano themselves, and you can find that video once I've finished stuttering uh, just up here. Yeah, from a technology perspective, they're made in one package, so they're the same, the same functionality. But uh, Ultegra is for a broader audience, so more different riding styles. Okay. So they were developed as a pair, but in mind that you ride in different places, different riding styles, different speeds. And uh, so the, the consumer does get the same benefits, yeah. but at a better price point. 
On to the quick fire round now, and the first question from here comes from 76 Rufus. How do Grand Tours have leaders' jerseys ready in sponsors' forward slash team styles? Is it just a generic jersey with a logo pinned, or do they print forward slash produce a single jersey on site? Or do all teams carry a version of the leaders' jersey just in case? This is a question to which I didn't know the answer to a few years ago until I was out at the Giro d'Italia commentating myself, having never received a leaders' jersey at a big race myself. Uh, and what they have are varying sizes of the leaders' jersey behind the podium, uh, where some somebody will pull down a print which puts the logos of the teams onto it. So they'll get that on the podium and then afterwards they'll be delivered a jersey or two to use out on the stage. So note they don't have a jersey for every single rider prepared just in case, they will do it immediately after the stage is finished. Dave Pratt, uh, a pro peloton question for you. Given that there seems to be a limited number of teams and riders that always seem to win, what percentage of the peloton is pack fodder? in brackets, teams forward slash riders that don't really have a chance but are there to round out the numbers. Well, I was probably pack fodder, if I'm perfectly honest. Uh, in terms of the percentage, I would say it's quite small. Uh, most riders, even if they're not there to win themselves, will have a dedicated job to do each and every day, uh, whether that's maybe to help Simon Yates if you're in Mitchelton Scott for this year's Giro d'Italia, or to help Elia Viviani if you're in the Quick Step squad. Uh, you will find some of the smaller teams, perhaps like, perhaps like Bardiani, uh, just trying to go up the road each day and doing the very best they can. But most of the riders who are in a Grand Tour, for example, will have very much earned their place because they've made the final eight riders from what is a team of between 20 and 28 riders. So there's not much in the way of pack fodder, but it's an interesting question nonetheless. Uh, next up, Ollie Daniels. Uh, how do teams in Grand Tours structure the workload in team time trials? Do GC riders get to draft the whole way? Uh, what if they're a particularly strong time trialist such as Tom Dumoulin? Uh, well, no, Tom will never sit on the back in a team time trial because he can make the team go significantly faster. The only time you might get a rider that's the uh, head of the GC for a particular team sitting on the back is if they are a real pure climber and they literally can't add anything to the front of the race or they fear they might get dropped on the flat. Quite rare to see that. I think I have seen in the past Darwin Atapuma sitting on the back of a BMC train, but as I said, it is quite rare to see. Uh, what they will try to do in terms of the workload percentage is make the stronger time trialists sit on the front for longer rather than increase the pace and put other riders into the red, they'll just make them go at the same pace for longer, so the other, ha right, other riders have longer to recover behind, and if they're not as strong, they'll go onto the front for 10 seconds, swing off, and start recovering again. But it is quite a complicated uh, strategy to work out, I think. Uh, Brian Schiff, do pro cyclists who crash in a race ever use the neutral bikes on the Shimano or Mavic cars? I saw a rider from Team Sky go down, and both neutral cars went by while he was waiting for his team car to show up. The answer to that is no, not if they can possibly help it. And there's a very simple reason for that. Uh, they're not going to be sure that they've got the correct pedals. A prime example of that was when Chris Froome needed a spare bike up Mont Ventoux a year or two ago. Uh, and he had to wait for his team car to come up because the spare bike from Mavic uh, didn't fit him and didn't have the right pedals. Also, the fit is another point. They have been working on that in neutral service, both at Shimano and at Mavic. And I think they're now starting to fit dropper posts so that the riders who do get onto a spare bike, if they have to and get roughly into the right position but they'll be changing back to their own spare bike as quickly as they possibly can they're basically just for emergencies uh, next up uh, Seth no one round one great name uh, how many seconds off the leaders jersey on a grand tour would be acceptable for you to attack the leader on the final stage final stages of grand tours are in general pretty much flat which means trying to attack the leader is going to come to nothing because a leader of the race will have a strong team around them and nobody's going to get up the road on the flat that's dangerous to the GC. However, I do think that if it was so close that somebody that picked up some bonus seconds at an intermediate sprint, which is generally a maximum of three, uh, could then go into the leader's jersey, then I think it would probably be game on. I don't think anybody could challenge them for trying to win a three-week race in that situation. Uh, next up, Guy Morris. Uh, I didn't know a pro jersey was so thin that sometimes they have to put sunscreen on the back of the jersey or underneath the jersey. Uh, yes, they can be. You've got to be careful with that. And even the pros do get caught out. Here is a picture of South Africa's Louis Menkes, who got caught out in the sun uh, where he lives. And in the same place, in fact, Chris Froome himself got caught out and got this burnt uh, from training in South Africa as well. So be careful because the jerseys are particularly thin these days. Uh, finally, we had this from Brad Taylor. 
This is from a couple of weeks ago. This video seems extra clear with additional depth to the quality which I was really pleased about when I thought he was talking about the answers to the questions. Uh, he then ends it with, have you got a new camera at GCN? Yes, that's why it's better quality and clearer. Our penultimate question now, which comes in from Christine Dickinson. Uh, when do I know when do, to use my big ring instead of my smaller one? Do I use the big ring as much as possible when not on the climbs? Difficult question to answer that one. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer, in fact. Uh, but don't think that your big ring is only confined to the flat or descent if you're strong enough to push one on the climbs. And likewise, don't think that your smaller ring is confined to climbs. Uh, it really depends on your overall fitness level and also what you're trying to achieve at any particular time when you're out on a ride. So if you'd like to go easy on a flat route uh, rather than using a big ring and then right up the cassette at the back so that you're almost cross-chaining, there's absolutely no harm in using your small ring there. Uh, some pro riders will try to stick in the big ring up short steep climbs just so it makes it easier to accelerate over the top. But as I said, the gears are all there to be used and you shouldn't really be worried about which ring you're in, just that you're at the right cadence uh, that you've selected which is best for yourself. Again, it can be quite a complicated subject, especially if you are very new to the sport, knowing what gear to use at what time. Uh, and four years ago already, time's flown past since then, uh, we did a little guide on how to use your gears which you can find in this next video. To a large extent, how fast you pedal or your cadence is self-selected. There is an optimum range, however, of between 70 to 100 revolutions per minute. Gear changes should be made to keep yourself in this range whilst maintaining your desired effort level. There is no way of telling what gear should be used in a given situation as it depends on a rider's personal ability. But if you can keep your cadence in this region, you know you are doing okay. Already on to our final question of the day. Uh, it comes in from Garth Garthley, presumably not his real name. Uh, my question is about crab. After I go on a training run, shower and rest, I get incredible crab in all sorts of weird muscles around legs and feet. How do I stop it? Well, I've chosen another very difficult question to answer because even science and scientists don't know why muscles cramp in the human body. Part of the reason for that is because it's quite hard to do tests for it. In order to find out why muscles cramp, they need to take muscle biopsies. And understandably, athletes in particular are quite reluctant to give up any of their muscle for the purposes of science. In terms of how to prevent cramp, there are people that say using electrolyte drinks can help because you do lose a lot of salt when you sweat, which is going to happen particularly when it's hot. Uh, old wives' tales almost say that quinine, which is found in tonic water amongst other things, can also help, but the jury's very much out on that one. Uh, what will definitely help is getting fitter because it's well proven basically that fitter people get cramp far less for the same intensity, and also acclimatization to heat uh, because Again, the hotter it is, the more people will tend to cramp. Now, somebody in a far better position to answer this question, I'm not doing a very good job of it myself, is Professor Louis Passfield, who we had in for another Ask GC Anything about a year ago. He answered a question along the same lines as well as many others. It was really, really interesting, and I thoroughly recommend watching that one now. Probably the first time I've handed to an Ask GC Anything from an Ask GC Anything, but it's the first time for everything. As I do. One of the things we notice is when people haven't trained heavily for a while, and then they do some heavy training, that's often when the cramping comes on. Got that a few times or recently. <laughs> classically, first race of the season, that yep. kind of thing. So it's the unaccustomed, stressful exercise that seems to be one of the triggers for cramp. So in those circumstances, just more training, more racing, sure. and it will, it will gradually disappear. The other situation where you often find riders struggling with cramp is when it gets hot and they're yeah. not used to it. And so there's a suggestion that it might be something to do with fluid or electrolyte balance. And again, as you, as you accumulate um, exposure to the heat, so you get more used to riding the heat, the, the cramping seems to diminish in those circumstances too. That is all for this week, I'm afraid, but if you've got any questions that you would like us to answer on next week's Ask Gs Anything, uh, simply leave them in the comments section just down below. Uh, speaking of the Giro d'Italia a fair bit today, a quick reminder that there are limited numbers of our special uh, Italy-themed t-shirts over at shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com, so get over there quick if you would like to purchase one. <laughs> Right, if you would like to watch another video right now, Emma's been over there asking the pros a few questions, including what do they think about in a time trial? That is just down here.